Let's all stand together and open our Bibles tonight to Hebrews chapter 2. We are in the book of Hebrews, believe it or not, on Wednesday nights. Man, this has been a tough time to be consistent in Hebrews with all that's going on in our world around us. But Hebrews chapter 2, and we were right in the middle of our lesson that is in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I'll read the odd-numbered verses. If you'll read uh, the even-numbered verses, 1 through 4, Hebrews chapter 2, to be on the screen in the New King James Version Bible. If you don't have that, you can look to the screens. And uh, chapter 2, book of Hebrews. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Wow, and Father, we do pray tonight as we study your word, as we worship you and learning more of you and your word. Father, we pray that you would visit us, each and every one of us, uh, with the awareness. I have to be careful how I ask about this, Lord, because you've given every believer a gift, at least one gift, uh, but it's for us to discover that gift. So, Lord, I pray that you'd give every one of us tonight uh, an intense passion and a stirring of our spirit to not be content living what is called Christianity without knowing why we are a Christian. What are we to be doing here and now? And so, Lord, I pray that for this body of believers, that we would not be content that we're going to heaven, that we would not be content that uh, we're safe and sound at this moment, but we would be content in living out every moment until we go to heaven, doing what you want each of us to do. And just in this gathering tonight, this, as it were, small group regarding this church. If just these Wednesday nighters knew what it is that you've called them to do in the body of Christ, the church, revival would break out. It would sweep this state and across this nation because if 12 people can do it, there's more than 12 people here tonight. So Lord, we are ready. In Jesus' name and all God's people said... Amen. You can be seated, church. We're looking at a message uh, uh, that we've titled, Having the Best. And the book of Hebrews, as we are learning from chapter 1 now into chapter 2, is that everything about Jesus Christ is better. Better than Moses. Better than angels. Better than the law. Better than the previous or Old Testament revelation, which is of God. But the Old Testament revelation was the promise regarding the New Testament fulfillment. That when we talk about having the best, we're actually talking about having Jesus Christ in an actual relationship. And those of you who are keeping notes, you'll see where I'm recapping here before we dive in. And the first thing we saw really, and it's the main thing that we see, is in verse one of chapter two. Having the best means that there's uh, this demand of our attention. That God is saying to us, now that the Son of God has been revealed, and this is who he is. Remember in our studies previously, we learned from chapter 1 that Jesus Christ, listen up, friends, listen, I mean this with all love, no, no critique at all. If you're watching tonight or right now, or if you're here and you are a cult member of some group, you've been taught lesser things about Jesus. But I want you to know that Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that Jesus is not only better, but that he is the creator God of all that there is. And the scripture even goes so far to say in the, in the book of Colossians chapter 1, that even angels have been created by Jesus Christ. So maybe you never heard that before, but that's why you're here, I hope. That's why you're learning in the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is the best. Best at salvation, best at forgiveness, best at vision, best at faithfulness. It's all him. It's all him. So it's been a while, but I remember some time ago, somebody asked me, why do we stress Jesus so much here? 
Because God the Father stressed Jesus everywhere in here. <laughs> in fact, the, the book of Psalms tells us that behold, in the volume of the book it is written of me. And by the way, that's going to be quoted again in Hebrews. It's all about Christ. God re has revealed himself through his son, our savior. And we saw it this way, verse one, therefore we studied this, therefore we must give the more earnest heed, listen to these challenges, to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. Notice church, as we looked at this last time, give, circle it there in verse one, give. That word means uh, the highest need, the top priority. Put it on the top shelf. This is the crowning challenge. To give, to give what? Earnest, the excessive, it means full, absolute attention and devotion. So he's really setting us up for what's about to come. Chapter one has been delivered. Chapter two opens up with verse one, that word therefore. So he's stressing that what he's saying, mark it in your notes, is of critical importance. It's top shelf. Give excessive attention to what he is saying, is the announcement. He says, give heed to this. That word means hold on. Remember, I gave you the, the shocking. I think it's shocking. It seems as though it doesn't fit, but it's the actual meaning. To take heed means to hold on to, to guard, to grasp with all vigilance. Watch this. It means to be addicted to. That is, that is major. Church, watch me. I'm going to exaggerate something right now. Somebody could be, maybe you and I could be, reading our Bibles, thinking, at work, driving, and we are communing with God. Right? We are having fellowship with God. You're thinking about God, and God is downloading thoughts into your head. You're pondering things. You're wondering this. You're wondering that. You're seeking God about a direction on an issue or that. And all this is going on in a moment's time. You're completely not aware. I mean, you, you are aware that you're driving, but you're not thinking about, you know, uh, even where you're at. It doesn't matter. You know, you're in route. You know where you're going. You're going home, but you're having these God moments. And the Bible is telling us right here, great. Make sure you keep doing that. Grasp onto that, hold on to that, and be addicted to that. I've said this before, but I, I, when I think of addiction, what, what do you think about? Addiction? Drugs. And do you remember Huey Lewis in the news, that band? And he sang a song, I Want a New Drug. Remember that? Does anybody remember that? Yeah. He goes, I want a new drug, one that won't make me sick. I want a new drug. And he goes down, and really what he does, it, the, the song will break your heart because Huey Lewis is saying, you know what, um, I don't want to get high anymore from the things of this world because this, this high makes me sick. This high doesn't do anything for me. This thing gives me a headache. This one causes me to be broke. And he says, I, I, I want a new high. I want a new drug. And little did he know, and I don't know, I hope he found out in time, that he was actually asking about Jesus and didn't know it. That his presence in your life is so tangible and real. Friend, listen. Don't think for a moment. If you're, if you're here and you're thinking, I don't know if God wants me in his life. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you want God in your life? Yes. yes. Well, then if you want God in your life, you should understand something right now. The only way that you could have the wanna is if he gave it to you. And he doesn't give any of the wanna. You know what I'm saying by wanna come to him. He puts that want to in you. To the person who doesn't even want anything to do with God, they don't care if they, they don't care about heaven or hell. They don't care about light or darkness. They don't care. But to the person tonight that is saying, I care, I want to know I'm going to heaven, I want to go to hell, I want to see God. You need to hear this. You need to be strong from this moment on, you need to grab on to the word of God, and you need to be addicted to it, and you get to be addicted to it, because guess what? He's invited you into the kingdom of God. Last Sunday, beautiful, beautiful moments, it was kind of fun. But uh, someone came up to me and said to me, um, I don't believe in God. And I said, I'm sure you have reasons why you do not believe in God. Well, yes, I do. But those reasons are going away little by little. And I said, that's fantastic. 
Listen, I'm not kidding, because, you know, we have to be careful we don't talk Christianese to people. And so I made it, I made it a point. I'm talking to a non-believer right now, right out in front of this church on Sunday. And they said, is there a program that I can sign up for? Is there a course that I can take to uh, get this taken care of? And I said, you mean, you mean get your questions answered? Yes, but I want to find out if God is real because right now I don't believe. And I said, well, there is not a course for you to sign up to. There's not a seminar to go and attend. But do you go to church here? I've just started coming. And did you have these kinds of thoughts before you came to church? No, this person here asked me to come. I started coming. And I come every week, and I'm having, now this, all this is going on. And I said, just let it happen. <laughs> just, 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 just keep coming. Just keep coming. Yeah, but I, I want to do something, I want, and I said, listen, I could say to you right now, I could actually get you to pray a prayer and send you on your way. I could probably talk you into the kingdom of God right now. You're really low-hanging fruit, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. God is at work in your life. You're going through this struggle. The veil, as it were, is falling from your eyes, and you're starting to see more clearly. You've got tons of incredible questions, because you know why? And this person said, no. And I said, I went just like this. I went, I said, he's reeling you in. But shouldn't we do something now? And I said, no. Now you're going to say, Jack, the golden moment. You should have sealed the deal right then and there. No, you know what? No, listen. God knows exactly where this person's heart is. And I would rather have that person be evangelized by the Lord Jesus Christ through the going forth of the Bible than ha having that person just recite something and go off thinking, Whew, I'm glad that's done. What's the next thing? Oh, no, no. Listen, I want you to go through a struggle. You and I don't remember, but when we were born into this world, it was a struggle. And it had to be a struggle because every one of us were just absolute ugly when we came out of our moms. Look at us. It looked like we'd gone through the ringer. <laughs> and we're all contorted and we all crunched up and goofy looking. And, uh, and yet that, that baby went from one world into the next. And when it comes to salvation, let that soul go through its struggle and go through its dynamic and let that soul grasp on with all addiction, as it were, to the work of God in their lives. Very important word. And then he said for us to uh, take heed to what we have heard, what we've listened to, a powerful word. That word, and it's kind of uh, amazing, it looks like a Japanese word, but it's a Greek word. It's A-K-O-U-O. -O. Doesn't that look Japanese? Maybe it is Japanese, but it's Greek. Maybe there's a, but, uh, but you pronounce it, it's kind of cute. It's aku. I mean, almost sounds like a little baby. Kuing. <laughs> and it's beautiful. In the hearing of, or that which you listened to, that which has come into your ears. This is so important. Why? You and I, every human being, is to be very discerning what they allow into their ears. Have we lost this discipline in our culture today? Jesus says, be careful what you hear. Man, is that, man, it's so powerful. Watch out, you don't need to hear everything. Oh, what's the latest? It, it won't benefit you to know. Be careful what you listen to. You say, are you saying not to listen to rock and roll? I'm saying be careful what you listen to. Don't, don't marginalize it. Everything that's going around you, be careful what you hear. Be careful what you allow. Because you know we have, what is this? The, uh, the eye gate, they call it, right? The eye gate. Things come into us through the eye. We have the ear gate by what we hear. We have, want to guard those gates. Is there a third one? I thought there was a third one. Mouth? Mouth? Food? Anyway. 
Why, why do we want to be so careful? Because there's a, a tremendous statement here that causes a lot of theologians to scratch their heads, and I, and I get it. It says, lest we drift away. Notice everybody, it doesn't say lest it drifts away, or the truth drifts away, or something drifts away. It says, what? We drift away. Look in your Bible there. It's about, if we don't take care and give full attention, we could drift away. And this now, I'm serious. I have got a stack of books on Hebrews, and you should see the chapters dedicated to the last end right there of verse one. Because this stack of books will tell you this is how you lose your salvation. And it goes through all these things telling you that's what that verse means. You can lose your salvation. Because if you don't do that, you're going to lose this. Then the other stack of books is warning you that it's consistent with the book of Hebrews, exhorting you, you better make sure that you're in this faith thing for real. By the way, that's the camp that I'm in. Make sure this faith thing is for real. So well, which one is it? I personally believe this. If, you're, if your faith is real, then you're going to continue on. If your faith's real, you're not going to let this stuff drift. If your faith is real, you're going to abide in Christ. If this faith, listen, if the faith in you is real, even if you're backslidden, you're going to run back home. I love that. There's other portions of Hebrews. We'll get into that uh, more. But. So I'm going to ask you to write these things down. And, 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 th and we pick it up where we left off now. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, was a verse I quoted, and then we had to end the service last time. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's a remarkable statement. Some people might say, here the Bible is teaching us that we work out our salvation, that our salvation is based upon works. Be careful how you say that. Be careful what you think. Church, be smart about this. What do we know for sure? What do we know that the Bible is saying? And what do we know for sure that the Bible is not saying? The Bible is absolutely crystal clear that you cannot earn your salvation. So when it says here in Philippians 2 regarding you and I giving all attention to Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1, it is this, apply yourself. Because you are saved, watch this, because salvation is in you, bring it out. Bring all of the attributes of God's Holy Spirit at work in your life out. P position yourself, place yourself uh, Make sure that you invest in the things of God in your life. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That word means with respect and awe to God. In other words, with full submission to God. It's not a works-based salvation. It's because I'm saved and I know it, I am going to pour myself into being what God called me to be. And that is the Christian experience. It starts at the moment of salvation and it ends on the day that you die. And it is exciting, white knuckle all the way through. I mean it. Whenever we say our Christianity is boring, that's an indictment upon us. We're the ones that are not yielded. We're the ones, if it's boring, if you yawn through your Christianity, then it's you, it's not him. He wants to change the world through you, your world, wherever you go. Remember that. I can't change the world. I'm just one little person. Come on. He means that wherever you go, you're the one that is on. You're the torch burning. Wherever you go. Yeah, but I only go from here to there. I do it five days a week. From eight to five. Are you on fire? Are you on fire doing that thing? Are you doing that thing? Five times a week? Yes. But are you on fire for Jesus' work? No, I complain most of the time <laughs> about it. Catch fire about it. Let the Holy Spirit take a hold of you and see what God will do. And then you know what? Maybe he'll change up your hours. Maybe he'll change up your route. This working out is remarkable. It's perpetual and it's a Christian reality. 
It's amazing to me because the realization of, of us having this Holy Spirit alive and working in us as he does, as I mentioned, and I want to read this to you, that between uh, Philippians 2, 12, when it says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, and he talks about both in the presence and away from, working out your salvation. This one author writes this, that the follower, the believer of Jesus Christ cannot become acceptable to God by or through himself, nor will Jesus Christ live his life through an unyielded vessel. He inhabits our nothingness of self. Did you hear that? The nothingness of self. See, what are you talking about? When you and I come and we realize this is, this is me, God, what in the world? I can't, I can't even work myself out of a paper bag and I'm supposed to work out my salvation? No, you come to him and you surrender to him in your nothingness. Only as a believer does our nothingness matter to God. When, when we come, and you know, it's the person that is most often the person that has so much of this world's uh, attention or talent. That's why you've seen people with great talent and you've even told them, you should become a Christian. Boy, you're a great salesman. Or you should become a Christian. You're a great, you, you can talk to anybody. You should become a Christian. Please don't ever say that to anybody ever again. They should not become a Christian because they're a good salesman. What are you saying? Oh, we, want, we need talented people in our church. The kingdom of God needs talented people. God says, excuse me? I've invited the outcasts to come. I've invited those who need forgiveness. I've, I've brought those who are not blue bloods. They're not royalty. Isn't that amazing? It, it just blows up the world's concept of peasants in relation to royalty. If you're a peasant, you're a peasant forever and you're doomed. But when Christ comes along, he takes peasants and lifts them up out of the mire and sets them on, sets them on his throne for crying out loud. I don't know how much we appreciate the gospel when we live in the Western world as we do. If you're living in some prison right now in Iran for your faith or North Korea, and you read that we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies, that's going to mean something to you. Pretty powerful. And so he goes on to tell us that this working out, and I'm, I know it's not Philippians is our study tonight, but I'm going to use it a lot here right now. Mark this down if you would. I love it. It's from Matthew Henry. I encourage you to read Matthew Henry. He says, This godly fear is a great guard and preservative against doing evil. We work outwardly our salvation because God has worked it into us spiritually and does work into us until that day. Matthew Henry, I forget, like 1680, 1690, he wrote that. That's a great statement. Don't you love that? Isn't that liberating? God is in you. He's working your salvation. That started when you began to be awakened to the works of God. And he's now continuing to do that work all the way through in your life. Psalm 63, I'm going to give you some verses. Psalm 63, verse 1. I'll read them out loud. We'll look at them together, but I'll read them out loud. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. That's working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because you are, listen, are you guys awake? Yes. Because you are saved, you think and say things like this. God, I want to seek you early in the morning. You say, I'm not a morning person, Jack. You may not be a morning person, but you've still had that thought. You may, you may not be a morning person, but you have said to yourself, man, I'd love to do that. I need to do that. I should try that once. Try getting up someday before the sun. I issue this challenge. It's not legalism. It's just fun. 
you ought to, you ought to try it. Just, just, man, I don't do that. I, I, why would I do that? I don't know, but it's something special about it. You can say, Lord, go, go to sleep tonight or whenever you think, you, but don't wait too long because you'll forget. So God, I want to just do Psalm 63 in my life. So Lord, will you help me get out of bed before the sun wakes up? Will you get me out? Ask him. Can you do that? Yes. All five of you are going to do that. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to come wake you up? I'll be awake. <laughs> Not that I'm spiritual. It's just that... Uh, Nighttime is to be awake for me, and my, my body doesn't work right. So early will I seek you, my soul thirsts for you. Now listen to yourself, judge yourself on this. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there's no water. It's California. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary. This is a beautiful verse, too, is amazing because it hints of the Song of Solomon. Um, he is searching for her or she is searching for him and they're looking everywhere and they're asking everyone, have you seen my beloved? Have you seen where they've gone? I haven't seen him in a day. Where is he? Have you seen him? Uh, I'm gonna go to the mountains and look for him and, and he's saying, have you seen my love? Do you know where she's at? I miss her. Look, the Song of Solomon is amazing but you should read it after you're married. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say about the book. And everyone's going to read it tonight. <laughs> so I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live and I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. So watch this, everybody. I'm not kidding, okay? Let's pretend nobody's here but us. This is what you would do with this. This is, if you take only this home tonight in this Bible study, it will be a success. If tonight or tomorrow morning, you open up Psalm 63 and you do this, out loud, go find a place. I mean it. Go outside, go to the bathroom, go to the TV room, go, I don't care. But I would do this. Oh God, you are my God. God, you are my God. I don't want any God but you, God. I will bow my knee to no thing or no one but you. Early will I seek you, Lord. Put that in my heart, my life. Whatever you need to change in my life, the disciplines of my life, change me up, Jesus. I invite you in. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Lord, my soul does thirst for you, but it needs to thirst for you more. There's still too much maybe of this world that has, has my attention. So God, force it out by your presence. I was asked this week, by the way, there was a, a national article in... The statement was that there needs to be this national coalition for men, Christian men against pornography and had all this stuff. And I, my comment was simply, you can put devices on your phone and on your computer and I guess that's a good idea, I said. But the greatest force and power for a man to have himself be pure is to love Jesus Christ most. And that is a fact. It's a fact. A woman struggling with her sin and a man struggling with his sin, the issue is this, that your love is divided for that thing in Jesus. You're struggling with who do you love the most. The thing that takes over you at times is because you love it more. That's, why, that's when it wins. In the 30s, Dr. Harry Ironside was on a train going from Chicago to Los Angeles. And he stopped, I believe it was in either North or South Dakota. And he was preaching and teaching in a church. And he gave the gospel. And at the end of the church service, they took up an offering for Mr. Harry Ironside to send him on his way to Los Angeles, 
Dr. Ironside. And when the ushers were passing the plate, there was a big, either a Sioux Indian or a Blackfoot Indian. And that big man said, when the plate went by, he didn't touch it. He just told the usher, lower, lower. And the usher put it lower. And he said, lower. And the usher put it lower. And he said, lower. And the usher got upset and put the offering plate on the ground. And the Indian stepped in the offering plate and lifted his hands to God. So you take Psalm 63 and you talk, speak, say it out loud to God. Watch what happens. He'll be listening. You'll be convinced and you'll know for sure God was listening to me. This happened the, two hours later. This happened two days, two weeks later. God actually heard me. He was listening. Don't pray anymore not expecting God to move. We pray, oh dear God, do this, bless that, and thank you for the hot dog, and away we go. And we don't expect anything to happen. We, we prayed, we prayed watered down prayers that have no spice to them. We've prayed this, this generic thing that, listen, it was so generic that if God answered your prayer, you wouldn't even know it. Because it was so nondescript, right? It was just there. But if you say, God, shake up my life, and you have to be afraid of him, by the way. You say, I can't pray that prayer. He'll blow me up. <laughs> you understand he loves you more than you do? Yeah. He'll take care of you. Say, God, shake up my life. God, do what you want to do. Amen. Incredible. Matthew 6, 33. Do you know it's going to take us 30 years to get to the book of Hebrews? <laughs> Matthew 6, 33 and 34, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. All the stuff that you think about and worry about. God says, you seek me first, I'll take care of that junk. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things, which is a beautiful statement. Worry cannot worry. Tomorrow is irrelevant to worry because worry is not a person. Jesus is saying, don't waste your life on worrying. Amen. It can't do a thing. <laughs> Colossians 1, 26, chapter 1, verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden from ages, from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory? Man, this is why you work out your salvation with respect and reverence of God. He's in you. He's ready to go like a horse out of a gate in your life. I love this one. This has always been a great source of aid to my heart for decades. Jude 1, 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Somebody say amen. amen. Wow. You don't need to know about my past, but I had certain thing uh, in my life as a life before Christ. And when God brought me out of it that night, I never wanted to go back. You know, some people, God... God removes some things from people instantly, and some people, some things, it takes a whole lifetime, right? You notice that? And for me, it was instant, and, but yet the fear of that thing laying hold of me again terrified me. God brought me out of it lest I die, but Satan, you know, gift wraps things. And I was so terrified of bumping into him somewhere <laughs> and him, him, you know, doing his satanic tricks and to come across that verse was freedom. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. When you start getting weak need, cry out to him. Say, wait a minute, Jesus. Wait a minute, Lord. Right now your Bible, your Bible said that you are the one that's able to keep me from stumbling. Clearly that verse is announcing that I cannot keep myself from stumbling. I need your power now. 
And let me tell you, friends, he will answer you. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Wow. Listen to this, William Barclay. William Barclay said, There can be no salvation without God, but what God offers, man must receive. It is never God who withholds salvation. It is always man who deprives himself of it. What a great word that is. I hope tonight you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're being challenged and encouraged by this invitation to apply yourself to the fact that you're saved. But if you're not a Christian tonight, I hope you get jealous for what we have. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Hebrews 6, 1 says, So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. In other words, you got to grow. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely, we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of, watch this, repenting from evil deeds. Duh. Duh. Right? Of course. This is a big one. (laughs) Number one, we don't need to keep hashing that over. You already know that. But you and I know people who say, well, I know I shouldn't be doing that, but God wants me happy. (laughs) Nope. And placing our faith in God, you should know that already. Verse two, you don't need to further be instructed about baptisms, I love that. Notice the plural word, right? Baptisms. That means baptisms regarding the Holy Spirit and baptism regarding water. You should know the difference. And the laying on of hands. Bible tells you, lay hands on one another, pray for one another. The resurrection of the dead. These things are the gospel. We know them. Eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we will move forward to further, or the word is deepen, understanding. That's a great word. Why do we do this? This is part of that moving on in our faith. This is part of the fulfillment of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Almost done. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. I said almost done. I'm almost out of time. I'm not done. But (laughs) Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. That's awesome. Please listen. If you don't have that, ask him for it. Ask yourself, can I and am I drawing near with a true heart and full assurance of faith? Tonight, you might say, yep, and I love it, and I'm just going to keep going. Maybe tonight you're saying, my heart's wretched. (laughs) I'm disgusting. And full assurance of faith... I'm a mess. I don't know if, if God even knows my name. I don't even know. Then call out to him. Take that verse and pray it into his ears and say, God, touch my life. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's a reference to the word, by the way. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised... I is faithful. Woo! I love that. Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Listen beautifully, it's all on Him. He saved you. He went to the cross. He's the one calling you. 1 John 5.13, you guys okay? We got like eight minutes. 1 John 5.13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Do you believe in the name of the Son of God? The word name, by the way, means authority. Do you believe in the authority of the Son of God? That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue, is the word, continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Hear that? Push on, keep going, don't give up. We need to remember that verse. The storm clouds are brewing again. Very soon. Don't be surprised. 
But this time will be different. Our culture is on the brink again. Businesses are going to shut down. All this stuff that's going to revisit and America will be no more. It will be the end. The next financial shutdown is the end of the United States of America. We will not recover. We will not make it. But this, it's brewing, and you're hearing it right now. Well, you know what? Uh, need to lock down again, I think, maybe. Need to shut down businesses and shut down churches and, go, and all this stuff. Listen, I'm not, I'll just tell you, I, I was told, Jack, just keep doing what you're doing because it's not going to go away. It will ebb and flow, but this is our new world. I was told that by an authority. Just learn how to mitigate life now in a different way because it's not going back to normal, never again. What if? Remember, we forgot. What if the government comes and chains these doors? Yes, we'll meet in the streets. We already talked about that. We have a plan. But what if? Who, we don't know. What if they use tear gas on us? You don't know? To break up the crowd. And they, de- they declare church as an unlawful assembly and they start taking you away. You don't know. We don't know. So these promises of God will be even more valuable to us. <laughs> right? You see, what if, we're all, what if we're all thrown into isolation? You'll, you, Christian, you can never be in isolation. <laughs> Didn't, didn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prove that one to us? What if they throw me in a fiery, fiery furnace? We've already read about that. Well, what if I jump off a ship and get swallowed by a big fish? We've already read about that. I'll give you this quote, and then, then we'll, uh, we'll pray. But it's from Jonathan Edwards. Read everything you can by him. In fact, the country you're sitting in right now is heavily, heavily dependent upon him. You may not even know his name. But Jonathan Edwards had a lot to do with the creation of the founding freedom documents of this nation by his preaching that affected so many people. Jonathan Edwards says, For it is God, God alone, who is with you. He who is in you, that worketh in you according to what pleases him. Not by any merit of yours does he, yet his influences are not to supersede us, but to encourage us in our personal efforts. Work out your own salvation is our duty to cooperate with his ongoing work in us. Oh, that's good. For it is God that worketh in you. Here is our encouragement, and oh, what a glorious encouragement it is to have the arm of omnipotence stretched out for your support and our comfort. What a tremendous statement by him. What a true statement. I love it. And then finally, this verse, Titus 3, verse 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Man, powerful, powerful truth. Church, let's pray together for this moment. Heavenly Father, we ask of you, Lord, it would be remiss of us right now, Father, as we've talked about salvation and as believers, we're even reveling in the fact that our sins have been forgiven We've been made new. We're not the people we used to be. And hallelujah, we're not, we're not the person we are tonight. Soon, we're not going to be us either. <laughs> You're just going to keep working in us. And every time you buff us and, as it were, spit on us and shine us and buff again, we start to reflect the glory of your face. And... I pray tonight, Lord, we pray tonight for any man or woman right now, boy or girl, who wants to have what we have to be set free. It's beautiful. It's awesome. As we remain in the attitude of prayer, I'm speaking to those of you who are not a Christian tonight. You're not a follower of Christ. You're not a a believer, I'll say. 
I speak for myself and many others in this place that, and maybe perhaps for believers around the world, that when we see all the rhetoric that's taking place in the world right now, we see all the people talking about racism, we see all the people talking about inequality and all this stuff, I have to confess to our unbelievers, unbelieving friends, it it puzzles us because we're not of that world. We don't see that. It's not us. You see, Jesus has done this to our hearts. We've been set free. We don't see, we don't see somebody of a skin color. We don't see somebody of a status. We don't see somebody uh, being special because they're poor or special because they're rich. We don't see somebody special because they're black or special because they're white. That's all been purged from us. You're not going to reform yourself Man's been doing that for thousands of years and fails. And by the way, he does it every New Year's Eve at midnight and flops by 6 a.m. I am not asking you to join this church. We We don't have membership. I'm not asking you to give a penny. Keep your money. I'm not asking you to do anything. Just sit where you're at. But I am inviting you to call out to Jesus and invite him into your life to wash away your sins and to give you a completely new perspective on life and to be awakened to the reality that heaven is real, Jesus is coming back, and he forgives sins. Oh, and did I say he's got a purpose for your life? So while heads are bowed, eyes are closed, I'm going to look across this room And maybe tonight you're ready to pray this prayer. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to do anything like that. But Jesus invited those who followed him publicly. And I'm looking. And if today, if tonight, wherever you are in the world at this moment, would you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins? of my selfishness, my lust, my anger, temper, violence, selfishness, uh, lust. Wash me clean in the fact that you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again from the dead three days later for my justification. I believe that, Jesus, and I'm giving you my life. I can't do this anymore. I'm t- I, I, I used to be s- scared of death and now I'm scared of life and I don't want to live anymore and I'm asking you to change my life transform me make me the human being I was supposed to be when you made me And I give you my life today. I do what I heard tonight in this Bible study. I come and I ask you to lower the offering bag, the plate, for me to step into it. Because I give you my life tonight. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the Word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button. Tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're going to continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us. No pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.